Okay, so uh, I'm not actually presenting on my thesis, but I'm going to be using some of the findings from the ethnographic research that I did in the course of my thesis. This is a proposal for a future paper, so what I'm going to be doing is giving a bit of the background information uh, from what we've gathered in the ethnography I've been doing so far, and then I'm going to build towards what we're proposing as a pilot study for papers. So it might be a slightly different format, but hopefully it's all going to uh, work out fine. So my subject area is performance and image enhancing drugs. Uh, this is primarily steroids. So I'm mainly looking at uh, athletics and body enhancement as opposed to neural enhancement or anything along those lines. Uh, and the idea for the paper is can we use personal trainers in commercial tr gyms as harm reduction outreach workers, uh, which I'll explain as we go through. So I just want to start with a bit of history on performance and image enhancing drugs and how uh, they've, they've evolved over years from being very focused on athletics and sports to being quite commonplace and becoming normalized. Uh, and that's actually the topic of my uh, doctoral thesis. So it starts off with uh, steroids particularly, but most performance and enhancers were used by high level athletes throughout the 20th century. And we didn't really see them used for other purposes. They began to filter down to amateur leagues and college teams in 1970s, 1980s, which Waddington covers in his research, and at around this time we also see the rise of bodybuilding and of course these big action stars of the 1980s, you've got Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, uh, and so on on the Hollywood screens. So bodybuilding becomes something of a popular phenomenon, uh, particularly within some regions and some subcultures. and. Peer use becomes a bit more normalized with that. People actually start using steroids for the purposes of looking better. And this is the first real period we've seen this with steroids. There have been fat loss drugs prior to this that serve effectively the same purpose, but in terms of adding large muscle bulk, this is really the first period. But what we've noted here, and you can see the references on the screen, are that it was only really normalized use within these subcultures with this specific training in mind. If you wanted to be a bodybuilder, you would use these drugs, but they didn't have quite the reach we're seeing nowadays. So what we're seeing now is individuals such as this. And they're using steroids primarily, I see we're getting a laugh for that picture, yeah. <laughs> but they're using steroids to look buff either for, for social media purposes, they want to get lots of likes on Instagram or Facebook or whatever just for how they look, or for going out to nightclubs and trying to pull girls and they think, uh, if I have a much better body and take my shirt off, that's going to increase my chances. And what we found in my research, which you can see I've referenced there, is that individuals who are part of this subculture tend to be a lot more uh, prone to risk-taking and using in a harmful manner than people who are using for sporting purposes, where use has been normalized for quite some time. So they're really going to be the, uh, the focus of this uh, proposed project. And I just want to compare some patterns of use based on my ethnographic findings, just to give you an idea of, uh, of the difference. So first we have some examples of sport-oriented users. And what we found is there's a real subcultural discipline wherein they'll somewhat regulate each other, make sure that other people in training environments who are sport-oriented will ensure their peers aren't using in a, a reckless manner. And this seems to be quite protectionist so that their sport doesn't come under fire in the media, especially I've got powerlifters and wrestlers here, which are sports where it's legal to use steroids. Those are the only ones that I uh, discussed in my thesis because obviously it's a bit harder to get people to speak if they're in a, a sport where they're banned. But what we found for these groups is that they'll ensure others in their group use in a safe manner. And as you can see from the examples I've given here, I'll just read these out but they've been using it in a, a very safe, very controlled manner. So Marish, the wrestler, says, I know how many vials I'm going through per cycle, uh, and when you take steroids, you do a cycle. So you use them for a prolonged period of weeks, and then have a certain number of weeks off. That's if you're using intelligently. Uh, he says, I know how many millimeters I'm going to use each week. Every single dose of everything, I've literally got a journal. So as we can see, very safe use, very smart use, knows exactly what he's doing. And then we have Martin, the powerlifter, who says, I didn't want to take a multitude of chemicals and not know which one's causing side effects, so I take each one in singularly, so you can see how your body reacts. So again, very smart approach to use, very cautious approach. And we can contrast this with these, uh, what's been termed uh, hedonistic or hedonic uh, users, who are image-oriented, and they tend to be very risk-taking and uninformed. So we have Josh, is the top example, who 
didn't know how to inject properly, hadn't researched how to administer an intramuscular injection and injected himself in a vein, which is obviously not a, a good thing to be doing when you're uh, injecting steroids. And then we have Pete, who's a member of this, uh, this lad culture, this uh, nightclub-oriented binge-drinking culture who are also quite big on their steroids, and he says they've got no issue putting stuff into their body. They'll take performance and image enhancers like they're smarties, you know what I mean? Uh, and obviously that's taken quite above the, the doses that you really should be taking, or that professional sportsmen have been taking. So this subculture, uh, I'm sure you've all seen, either if you've been out in town and seen these people, or if not, you've seen reports of, of this subculture. So I just thought we'd have a look at what the prevalence of this type of use is. Well, Bates and McVeigh had the most recent quantitative research in this field from uh, last year, and they found that only just shy of 20% of the people surveyed had a sport-oriented goal as their primary motivation, whether increasing strength, speed, endurance, athleticism. Less than 20% had that. About 80% had things such as look more muscular or lose fat. So it suggests up to 80% of use of performance enhancers these days could be motivated by these hedonistic uh, ideas. <clears throat> so that's why we really need to focus on this subculture. Uh, so in the course of my ethnography, we had a notice of the prevalence of this trend showing it probably is generalizable and it's not just limited to where basin based study took place. So I have um, Colin here, physiotherapy student, so he knows how the body should look naturally. Uh, and he also works as a part-time doorman to fund his, his studies. And he notices on the doors, you can notice it, I had these 18-year-old lads come up and I'm thinking, there's no way that's how an 18-year-old's body looks naturally. And he's right, anybody who knows much about physiology will have noticed there are a lot of young guys walking around nowadays who do have much bigger shoulders, bigger chests than you ever would have seen naturally, uh, historically. And then uh, Stephen, who's a gym owner, owns a commercial type gym, and he says, he thinks so many teenagers do it now, and that the growth of use in steroids has been massive, uh, just based on what he witnesses as a gym owner. So as he's noted, he thinks they're very prevalent in the 16 to 21 age range, and notes most of these guys aren't even playing sports, they're just using it to look good. So, in terms of harm reduction, excuse me, <clears throat> as I noticed, uh, there's been a few examples in my ethnography and in Bates and McVeigh's research of this uh, subculture using in quite a harmful manner. But in terms of harm reduction, We've noticed that needle and syringe programs are now reporting that uh, particularly steroid users tend to form the majority of people visiting them. Uh, and as we know from Guy McCord and McVeigh's 2014 survey, 85% of the services that they spoke to reported that more than half of users took performance enhancers. So it's very widespread, very prevalent, and as we noted, about 80% of this seems to be this hedonistically oriented uh, harmful use. Now, as Simmons and Kuma note, a lot of peer users don't want to go to these services because there's a perceived stigmatization of injecting drug users, which means the prevalence is probably even higher than Kima Gord and McVeigh suggest. So I've got a quote from my own ethnography from uh, Simon, yes, who's an image-oriented gym user, and he says, you can go to Boots to get needles, but I don't want people who work, I know, excuse me, I know people who work in Boots, so I don't really want them to know that I've got a bin full of needles. And that was quite a common thing that we noticed in the course of this ethnography. So quite a few people ordered needles on eBay. And of course, you're not getting the advice on how to inject safely then. As we saw in Josh's case, he injected himself in a vein, not knowing what to do. So it's a problem people are avoiding these services. And as we know from Pete, who is a member of this, this lad culture, he says they all supply each other. Uh, and whether that's needles or steroids, it's, it's all the same sort of thing. But basically, there'll be one who orders a batch of needles from the internet and he hands them out to his friends when they want them. So obviously quite risky behaviour, not getting the information they need. Uh, very problematic. So, this refusal by some to use NSPs, obviously a lot of them are, given the prevalence found by King Gordon McVeigh, but in terms of the, the hedonistically oriented individuals who are the ones most at risk, they don't tend to use these. So we need to find some other form of outreach whereby we can get harm reduction information to them safely so we don't have a lot of people coming to hospital saying, I've stabbed myself in a day. So, can personal trainers be used?
for harm reduction? Well, first we need to explore whether personal trainers are approached as sources for advice in the first instance in gyms. And several respondents in the course of my ethnography actually confirmed that yes, personal trainers are very frequently, as we see from uh, Raphael, says yes, very frequently they're engaged in being asked for advice on performance and image enhancers. Significance, this is powerlifters, wrestlers, the, the, and bodybuilders, these hardcore trainers, so-called. They will train in gyms that tend to not have registered personal trainers. They tend to just be uh, a warehouse or just a room with lots of free weights. So the fact that personal trainers are having a lot of people come to them shows that it tends to be these image-focused uh, subcultural members who are visiting personal trainers. So that's a very good thing from our perspective because it shows a potential route whereby advice can reach these people. And as we know, Mark at the bottom is also a personal trainer. He says there are some members within the gym that pay for a personal trainer just so they can get information on performance and image enhancers. But he does note that one of the problems with this is whatever dosage the personal trainer says the person should take is what the individual ends up taking because, of course, the personal trainer is seen as an authority figure. So what we need to explore at this stage is where the personal trainers are giving out good advice and then we can base any harm reduction efforts on what we need to do once we're aware of this. So that's what I'm going to tackle next. Are personal trainers knowledgeable on safe use? So I've got a case study here. This is Josh who, as we saw earlier, had injected a vein. Now this was before he ever engaged a personal trainer when he was just training as a, a group of hedonically using uh, young lads as they, they term themselves. And then after this, after his negative experiences, the next time he went to use steroids he spoke to a personal trainer because he had learned from his mistakes he wanted to make sure he did it right the next time. So, he undertook what's called a 12-week challenge, and these are increasingly popular, again evidencing the fact that there's been a real shift towards just image enhancement uh, for purposes of, of showing off. So here's a, a fairly typical example. I actually took this photograph myself in a local gym. But as you see, they've got their fresh start 12-week transformation event. You can see the, uh, the body types on display there. Uh, I make no comment. And there's a, a financial offer. Uh, reward, excuse me, for, for whoever makes the greatest difference. So perhaps motivation to use performance enhancers there. Uh, and as we know, JP's personal trainer told him he should take Anavar to help him uh, improve better in this time period so he would uh, be more successful in his 12-week challenge. And JP asked his trainer, he's had this negative experience injecting himself in a vein, he's not sure he wants to take steroids, and he says, is it anabolics? Is it anabolic steroids? And the personal trainer responds, no, it's not. Anabolic steroids is obviously testosterone-based. It's trembolone, you can get all sorts. At which point in our interview, I interject and say, Anabar technically is a steroid, it's an anabolic. And JP responds, yeah, which I know now. At the time, I was like, oh, okay, right? Okay, that's fine. Doing research now, yeah, Anabar is a murder steroid. So the personal trainer actually misinformed JP. Now, the question is, was the PT misinformed himself, was the PT ignorant, didn't realize he was recommending steroids. And that's sort of what I'm hoping for the future of my report, but of course there is always the element of PTs make their money based on how quickly their clients improve, how much their clients' physiques improved. So there could also be some quite, uh, quite dark motivations for a PT giving somebody bad advice. But we're going to proceed from here hoping that the PT was misinformed, I mainly because I don't have time to discuss the other. So, look at the dosing. This PT recommended that JP take six clenbutrol tablets a day, and they're 20 microgram tablets as the standard dose. And JP notes it is a very high dosage, but the PT told him that, said obviously a lot of people can't handle that, they have shakes, stuff like that. Now one thing I want to bring up here is the possibility that if you tell a young man, oh you should take six, but you might not be able to handle it, possibly there's going to be an element of masculine pride involved where they think, well, if if six is the dose to take, then I'm going to take that because I you know, want to prove that they're tough enough to take it. So I think that's the first thing we need to address uh, in terms of speaking to trainers. But as you know, the trainer only told him, oh, they have shakes, stuff like that, as though that's, that's the worst thing that's going to happen if you overdose some clenbuterol. So I've just listed the side effects there for you uh, from Llewellyn's anabolics, uh, 10th edition, I believe, rapid breathing, blood pressure, irregularities, irregular heartbeat, and consciousness. You can see it. So pretty uh, unpleasant effects, so 
trainer, again, perhaps misinformed, didn't understand quite how severe it can be. Now, Monaghan, in his 2001 publication, Research from the 1990s into Bodybuilders, said that they took between four and seven clenbuterol tablets a day, and that the side effects from seven were described by users as scary, very scary. As we know, JP was told by his personal trainer to take six, which is on the high end of that four to seven of what the bodybuilders were using. And this becomes even more significant when we see that drug doses tend to be scaled to body weight. The heavier you are, the higher dose you can have without having severe side effects. So JP wanted to look like this, the fitness model, and uh, Monaghan's bodybuilders obviously held significantly more mass, meaning that they could take a much higher dose of drugs before they experienced these severe effects. So they were saying that seven were very scary, I agree. <laughs> If they were saying that seven pills were very scary and they were walking around 105, 110 kilograms, and JPs walking around perhaps 80 kilograms, taking six is potentially quite dangerous for him. Uh, and the same thing happened for Anivar, which was the steroid the trainer told JP to take. He told him to take 200 milligrams a day, whereas Martin, who is a competitive power lifter, very high level, he uses 100 a day. So, again, this idea that somebody who's walking around 80 kilograms should be using a high dose for a bodybuilder of Clem and twice the dose of a high level power lifter for Anivar suggests that PTs at the minute aren't very well informed. So, just a quick look at consequences of misinformation. Obviously, I've already told you some of the negative effects that can be experienced. Fat burners such as clenbuterol are perhaps more problematic than steroids because they have a reputation for being lethal if used in excessive dosages, which steroids don't necessarily. And again, as I note, very important when we're bearing in mind that it's all scaled to body weight. So if personal trainers have read sources based on what a powerlifter should take, what a bodybuilder should take, and then they're recommending this to clients, it could have very bad consequences for clients. So there's a couple of examples of people who have, have died. Uh, the woman on top obviously died directly as a result of the diet pills. Uh, this Facebook model, Z's, uh, he was using cocaine, drinking alcohol as well. But of course, when we're talking about this hedonistically oriented nightclub focused subculture, they will be using these drugs. Uh, so it is worth addressing that mixing fat burners with cocaine, not the best way to go. Pete, who I referenced earlier as a member of this subculture, has three friends who have had heart attacks. That's not normal for guys in their early 20s. So very significant we get uh, important information out to them. So I've already noted personal trainers might recommend a dose that works for them, but for a lighter client, it might have very severe side effects. Mark Osborne, who is a personal trainer, noted that a fellow trainer and friend uh, took peers for a couple of months, got really great results, and then everything went downhill, suffered from massive depression, lost his job, everything. So the problem here is he may well have recommended to individuals that they use steroids, the same doses, same cycle he was, when he was seeing good results, without realizing a lot of problems with steroids occur on cessation. Fat burners obviously occurs when you're using them. So there might be some confusion there, which again, could cause severe issues. So really what we've learned is, personal trainers are seen as a source for information by a lot of these uh, image-oriented subcultures but they possibly don't have appropriate knowledge themselves. They might be using a reckless or harmful manner themselves. Now, needle and syringe programs are avoided by the very people we most need to visit them. Sports-oriented individuals tend to visit these programs, hence Chemogord and McVeigh's research. So really, it's the people who most need targeting are the ones least likely to get harm reduction information. So, given that there is harm reduction outreach workers employed in terms of other injecting drug using populations to give them harm reduction information. Is it possible that we can adapt this by giving PTs correct advice or some resource so that they can actually be informed and when they're speaking to people in the gym who want advice on how to use beards can give them sensible advice. So my paper is just to propose a pilot study and all we're going to do is go to a limited number of gyms give PTs access to a resource based on safe academic medical information on how to use correctly, and then they can refer clients. And we're going to measure this both quantitatively, using measuring access to the resource, and qualitatively by asking personal trainers to give feedback on whether they've noticed any differences in themselves, and particularly in clients, where the clients actually adapt and use more intelligently based on this resource. 
Uh, and then depending on the feedback and funding, this scheme can be enlarged to cover more gyms and what fights appropriate. So that's going to be the focus of my paper. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Yes? I was wondering how much information there is on young women's views. Ah, young women. Yes, there was uh, an article in Times magazine a few weeks back that was quite good. From a journalistic perspective, you get quite a lot in the style of uh, ethnographic explorations. There's not so much quantitative data. It tends to be a lot harder to get women to speak about their use than men, other than in the case of bodybuilders who, as noted, tend to be focused on their sports, so they're less likely to use in a harmful manner. So in terms of just women using regularly in the gym, I would have thought, I would have thought one of the best means of accessing this would be if an ethnographer, preferably a, a female one, specifically went out and addressed these groups. Uh, my research was obviously a lot broader based, so I didn't look at it, but that could definitely be some future research, future research focus. Yes? Yes, you. Um. Um, could you tell me about how you created your sample frame for these study and how, how large the sample was? Uh, the sample was 26 individuals in total. Uh, it was based on researcher immersion. So I would go to gyms and I would... Uh, I used to powerlift, I've competed in uh, two competitions. So I could speak to people, people would see me very visibly as somebody who knew what they were talking <coughs> about. And then I would ask them if they were interested in participating in an interview and then I would interview people, and so I got a range of, of individuals, either from powerlifting or similar sports, or just people who I met in the gym, which was the image-oriented people I quoted, gym owners, personal trainers, that sort of thing. So it was 18 interviews and 26 total respondents. Sorry, can I ask you another? Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely I'm fascinated in, in, in how you build your, your um, sample and how and so was it based in one location or you, in total, it was, it, was, it was eight gyms in total, uh, and I trained in four of those, and I, I met people very often. Uh, if, you're, if you're someone involved in these scenes, it's, it's a bit easier to meet people who are, who are also involved. So particularly with powerlifters, I found it very easy. Now in terms of the uh, hedonistically using uh, lad culture, they were a bit harder to access because I'm very visibly not one of them. But thankfully, uh, through speaking to personal trainers and so on, that got me a couple more connections with, with these individuals. So I was able to interview them. Yes? Uh, when it comes to taking or well, getting PTs to give advice over steroids or whatever to their uh, clients, do you not think it's a better option to get them to say, to your GP or a medical professional because ah, you don't well, need anything yes, to that, get that's, that's actually a very, um, a very good question. What I found, and I'm, I'm going to preface this actually, I'm based in Devon, all my research was based in Devon. Young males, young guys living in that region, not many options, most of them are looking to go in the military. They are very, very worried about having anything on their medical records, such as drug use. So. Broad, more broadly, country-wise, yes, that might be an option, but certainly from my sample, nobody wanted to speak to a doctor. They were all very nervous. I even have one guy, uh, it's a bit personal, I won't say which one it was. Yeah, I included it in my thesis, but basically, he stopped using steroids, and obviously your testicles shrink when you're using steroids. He had one comeback about twice the size it had been afterwards, thought he had testicular cancer. Still didn't go to a doctor. Couldn't have that on his medical record because then you can't be in the military. So, yeah, it's probably more severe in Devon than elsewhere, but there has to be some options for these sorts of individuals who, who can't go to a doctor or won't go to a doctor. And again, we saw with the NSPs, we have these services provided, all gyms are aware that they exist, and yet very few people willingly use them because there's this stigmatization associated with. What information is PTs tech, or what are you going to get them for PTs to give them? Well, this is just a, a proposal for a pilot study, but it's essentially going to be an online resource that they can access, which is going to tell people basically everything you would get from an NSP, but we're going to make it so that they don't have to physically go there to get that information. Okay? Yes? So, so, just to be very clear, a personal trainer there doesn't need to be actually registered or have qualifications? They generally will have a qualification in something along 
the lines of personal training or they might have a degree in strength and conditioning. And it depends on the establishment. Some are very strict and say you have to have the appropriate qualifications, level three qualification. Others will just have people who are hired as gym staff but give advice on training. So you, you sort of have two tiers, official pers personal trainers who are qualified and people who aren't. But just being qualified in personal training doesn't mean you know anything about drugs because they don't tend to teach that in these courses. Because again, we've got this real stigmatization of drug use and we like to sweep under the carpet that a lot of these people are going to use drugs. So it's not really taught. Yes? If the users are intending to join the military, they then have to sign a form to say they're not using drugs. Yes. So there's a loop of, of I need the body to be considered fit enough to join the military, so I will do this illegal thing, but I know it's illegal, um, and I'm hiding the fact, because I'm hiding it, because I'm not going to my GP, and I'm yes. also going to make a false declaration on my medical form when the time comes. Yes. Why do they want to join the military? Because it has a moral, the military has a moral imperative, so why are they prepared to lie to get into the military? But, uh, it's, I, I blame it on there not being very many jobs. I mean, I'm from Devon, it's extremely rural. If you're a young man, early 20s, not that many options. Marines is based down there, it's probably the best option for a lot of these young guys. But in terms of research into the military, that's a project I'm actually hoping to do next, but we have to find funding and an institution interested. But that is actually my next intended goal after this. Anyone else? Or? Yes? Right, all these uh, drugs legal or illegal? Ah, they fall into a, an interesting grey area. Steroids, are, they're technically class C, but possession has been decriminalised. So in terms of military, you'll get in trouble for using them. They don't like you to use them. In terms of if the police catch you and you've only got two vials and it's clearly for personal use, they'll let you go and they'll let you keep the vials. Now where this becomes most interesting is in terms of people ordering steroids online into the country. Technically they're importing them, which should be a criminal offence. But it tends to just like get let through by um, revenue and customs. So yeah, there's, there's an interesting exploration there in terms of the legality of them. But generally, users is considered legal and, and selling is considered illegal. And if a personal trainer is recommending it, or does he only recommend a safe dose when asked by someone who's actually going to Os do it? Ostensibly, in terms of our project, they only recommend <laughs> safe doses. Unfortunately, in some gyms, yes, there are personal trainers who sell. That does happen. And it shouldn't, but that is a reality. So we would rather that they know personally how to use safely and they're not recommending dangerous doses, rather than we say, oh, we can't be involved in this in any way because it's illegal, which we think is going to be a lot more harmful long run. Do they supply as well? Do they supply personal trainers? Yeah, yeah, some of them do. Uh, they're not supposed to. Most, most gyms have a policy if you're caught, you'll be kicked out, you'll be fired. But uh, it definitely happens, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.